if you need help, let them know you need help. Don't struggle because everyone knows you're on a different unit. Everyone knows you're not as home unit, so you're going to have questions. You're going to have have times where you're going to need somebody else to help you. So don't try to, don't make yourself drown for no Ooh, reason. Oh, I got to go. Hey. I've been working, so them please don't hit my phone. Yeah. I'm in my zone, bro. Just leave me alone. Hey. Was on the road, but I swear I'm coming home. Hey. Now the drinks on me, I think we need a toast. Hey. See, I did it for me. Now my old friends calling, told them nothing's for free. Told me time is money, dog. Swear I paid all my fees. I was starving for this game. Now my fan they can't eat. Hey everyone, welcome to the Cup of Nurses episode. Here with your hosts, Peter and Matt. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We are nurses on a mission to change the world. Those that are new listeners, welcome. You will find a ton of value in this podcast and if you do find value in this podcast don't forget to like comment subscribe share with your loved ones that's what boosts us on the algorithms we get more downloads and this is ultimately what motivates us to keep on producing this high quality content some housekeeping cup has all the resources that we talk about in the show as far as show notes the gear that we're wearing here peter's wearing the nurse fit shirt i'm wearing the the og cup of nurses shirt established in 2017 baby get on couple nurses dot shop and for our sister site we are frontlinewarriors.com for anything related to consciousness self-awareness you'll find a ton of resources there and it's forever expanding and the last project that we're working on to attain this mission that we're on is pronto we're trying to innovate healthcare employment and transform the way the healthcare market functions so i'm excited for that how you doing pete i'm doing great man thank you Today we're going to talk about how to survive floating. We've been floating a lot. This contract, this is the most I've ever floated ever in my nursing career. And there's always like a stress attributed to, to floating because you're going to a new environment. But there's like things to consider and take into account just to make it a more enjoyable experience, you could say. Because floating is definitely tough, especially if you're doing ICU and you float somewhere else and now you have more than two patients. It's always an issue for me. Definitely when you walk into the office and you look at the assignment, walk into a unit, you look at the door, wherever the assignment sheet is hanging, and you're like, damn, I got to float. Yeah. You do get a little bit disappointed, but the rest of the response that you have to your uh, unit's policy of floating and wherever you're floating, it's going to dictate how that shift is going to go. Yeah, It's always a little more chaotic, you could say, because, <clears throat> like for example, you go into work and you can never predict how your night's going to go. There's, there's like no way of predicting it. Now it's like your neighbor predict your work environment and now you're getting floated. So it's like a double whammy. You know, it's like you're almost like double confused, you could say, or double unsure. So it's definitely a lot scarier. But the benefit of floating is usually like higher pay. Uh, it's more of an incentive to to flow. I know if uh, if you're doing like floating at like your staff position, those positions usually you get paid more. Yeah. And ultimately, this episode is just to survive floating mm -hmm. as it is you might be a float nurse already so you might be required to float so this will give you tips on how to survive all that you might be on a travel assignment you just might be on your home unit you got to float somewhere else because your shorts mm -hmm. or their short staffed or units a little bit less busy or the extreme where peter and i are doing it religiously mm -hmm. multiple times a shift multiple times a week so we're going to go over and discuss all that yeah the first thing you should always do is just remain calm Cause you're going to get a little bit anxious. I get a little bit anxious each time I get, I get floated. There's like, just like a, like a spookiness to it. Cause you're not sure where you're going, especially if it's like a unit they haven't floated to. For example, for us, we're in ICU. We could float to, you know, four West, four North, any of the fifth, any of the, the units on the fifth floor, then the step down unit. So, not, not including another mm, hospital, which mm, totals like 16 units of possibility. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Cause I forgot. Yeah. Cause I forgot about that. Float another hospital. Yeah. So there's so much units. So it's, it's always like there, there's always this uncertainty of, of what's going to happen and where you're going to go. So just try to remain calm, like understand that, hey, you've been a nurse for X amount of years. Uh, you know what you're doing. They're obviously floating you because they think you're competent, comp competent enough to float. Otherwise, they, they wouldn't float you. Maybe they might float you one time, but they're going to notice that, hey, you can't handle this. So maybe they're going to escalate things to the manager. I feel like some hospital might, might, be, might do that to somebody. I, like now that I think about it, I don't think I, our hospital is doing that at all because everyone just, just floats. But just like, like we're saying, just remain calm and... And just, just take it for what it is. Yeah, this tip is very all internal mindset based. Uh, just like we said, you you see that report sheet and you feel a little bit down, a little bit negative about the situation that you're in. 
just like Pete said, you've got to kind of go do what you got to do and go to that unit. And you have no idea how much of a difference it makes when you come to the new unit in a positive attitude, not upset, say hello, and just truly know that you're going to provide great patient care. That's where like the self-talk kind of comes in. If you're, you know, talking negatively or you're setting your mood for, for a, for negativity, it's going to manifest. And ultimately the people are going to see that and they're not going to want to participate in your environment or help you out as much maybe let's just say because of your negativity so Mm -hmm. drop that as fast as possible it's not gonna work well and floating and just be positive no matter what happens and just be confident what you're doing if you feel maybe you're struggling with the idea or you're anxious right we talked about anxiety where you might not feel competent in this unit that you're going to don't forget that you've worked very hard for Mm -hmm. your degree you've if it has taken you four years to get your bachelor's if you're a bsn or maybe you have a lot of experience you've been doing this for five six seven years you got what it takes understand that you have you will just trust yourself that you'll know what to do when it comes to patient care in any given environment just like we talked about in some episodes just know your abcs and you'll do good so just remain calm and you are good enough in the position that you are in yeah you're definitely smarter than, than you think you are I'm curious on what do you do when you approach like a unit. So when I go to, when I get floated, the first thing I do is, hey, um, I'm here, I'm floating from an ICU. So then that way everybody knows that I'm floating from an ICU. So it's like, it, it almost, um, it makes you a little bit, you could say you're providing them with some information. So they know a little bit about your background, not just like, hey, I'm here, I'm floating because they don't know where you're floating from sometimes. So it's always good to just say that way, that way everybody, like the charge nurse or nurse around you know that you're floating from an ICU. So you're obviously not going to be as good as doing certain things that they are good at. Yeah, and I glad, I'm glad i glad that you brought that up because in our situation, there are so many ICU nurses that are traveling. You might float to a unit where mm-hmm. there's two ICU nurses that are working or in this hospital, the units are split. So 5 West has like this, uh, these two sections and you don't know which ICU nurse is going to be there. So mm-hmm. tell them right away your name, introduce yourself just so they know where to stick you in that unit. Uh, there was a couple of times or once or twice where I already got my assignment. I didn't tell them. It just says ICU. Another ICU nurse came, actually talked to the unit clerk and already put their name on there. And I'm mm-hmm. like, wait, wait, I'm already getting a report. And it was a little bit of a mixed miscommunication. So definitely introduce yourself right away and say hello. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another big one is to ask questions. It doesn't matter how long you've been a nurse for, how long you've been in one specialty for. It's always good to ask questions because there is a big difference from working the ER versus a tele floor, a huge difference. Same with going from ICU to its own college, big difference. So no one's going to judge you on your, like your competence. Cause I feel like sometimes people don't ask questions cause they feel that you feel they're inferior. Putting, right. You feel inferior. Like you're not smart enough. You should know, know these things because you've been a nurse for this amount of time, but you are in a different unit. So it's completely okay to ask questions. And plus it leads to a smoother shift because you're always, you're showing your vulnerability to somebody. You're showing them that, hey, you're able to ask them for help or guidance because you're not sure on how to do things and, and they know. So you put in a trust in them to show you on how to do things and it just opens up a better relationship than kind of having to have things your way and just doing it the way you think is right and then having them fix your mistake. 100%. Don't be ashamed and don't forget that it's a 12-hour shift. You could ask these questions all along. It could be freaking 15 minutes before your shift. Go ahead and ask. Mm-hmm. There's no such thing as a stupid question. So starting off this float, you introduce yourself. I would definitely try to find the charge and let her know as well because she's operating the unit. Uh, you have tr- uh, charge nurse experience. You could, it definitely would be a good idea to introduce yourself to the charge. Uh, maybe she can assign you someone that could give you a little tour about the unit of where things are, or it might be her. So things to be asking like one important thing that you always should be knowing is where's the medication room because rn is refreshments and narcotics so refreshments is going to be the nutrition room where are the snacks where's the peanut butter where's the yogurt where's all that good stuff apple juice you name it mm-hmm. you should know the nutrition room plus you need some water for yourself to refill know that room and then narcotics know where the medication room is in some places if you are a traveler you're going to run into not having access to the pixis do that right away. Go ahead and ask the charge nurse to make sure you have ac- Pixis access because then if she's doing something and she's busy in a room, then you need your med. You might have to be kind of waiting till you get access. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's also a really good idea to kind of structure 
your your uh, routines, for example, and structure. I mean, like first you have to figure out what their unit structure is, and then you have to mold your structure onto theirs. Depending on where you're gonna flow, you're gonna need to do vitals twice a shift, three times a shift, maybe every couple hours. It it depends. You have to know what they require you to do. Some units like Tally require you to print a rhythm strip, or do you need to get daily weights because someone's getting a diuretic? So try to figure out what the highest demand points are on the unit. What is the unit requirements? What are you required to do every shift? Patient care is, is standard. You're going to, if you're on nights, you're going to do the, do the baths, you're going to ha hang medications, do all that standard stuff. But each unit has its own actual little thing that they focus focus more on. Like AccuCheck, some units don't don't have a lot of AccuCheck, some do. Uh, antibiotics, TPN, like it's, you got to figure out what they actually do and what they require you to do. What's interesting about those AccuChecks is we talked about it in a debriefing where it feels a little bit unsafe when you give an insulin at 6.30 and the food tray might not ri arrive at 8 o'clock. Another thing when I'm thinking about this, the root, unit routines and things is like knowing where the supply room is, of course, and the, the supply room. And ultimately knowing where your supplies are. So your flushes, your alcohol pads, which I always keep on, you might need to know where the glucometers to do your job. And then also if you're floating to a lower tertiary unit, like in our cases, where's the damn vitals machine? Mm -hmm. I feel like it's always hard to look for a vitals machine because someone takes it out of the room, takes it out of your room. You don't know what's going on. Sometimes there's no thermometer and it just gets a little bit frustrating because you need that thing to, to you know, check on your patient's vital signs. Mm -hmm. And it's super tough, especially if floating a lot because you never fully learn an equipment room or supply room or a medication room. If you're floating once a week somewhere, or even twice a week in, in our case, and sometimes even at 11, it's really hard for you to fully, fully know the supply room. So like the one thing I always um, try to do is like the basics, like you said before, the flushes and certain emerging things like the suction stuff, all that, all that kind of stuff. So I first try to locate that, but it's, it's super hard to learn each supply room, each equipment room if you're floating a lot. That's like the one thing that's kind of super annoying because it, like I said, it takes a lot longer to learn. So when you're traveling, you don't feel that you fully like know every unit up until you probably like a month in. That's how it is for me. Like I'm, I finally realize I know most of these units now, and you know our contract ends in the next f five weeks. So it, it takes time it took so, over a contract to mm -hmm. figure it out. Yeah. So if you ever wonder why nurses that flow get get paid more, like if you're in a in a staff job, this is why it it takes a lot of time to learn all these specific things but you're universal so you're very disposable so you get so your benefit to the hospital is you could go anywhere but the thing is you're not going to be super proficient in everything you're, you're going to know the basic emergencies and the basic structures and that's all you're going to do you're like you're like a navy seal that's what it is you're going man. in and you're coming out it's straight business it's really yeah i'm glad at least what the hospitals do is they give us like universal keys for the most part when it comes to the med room and other units mm -hmm. or you have badge access to those things you're not putting in a code where you have to like keep an Apple Notes to like understand if you're uh, floating between two different hospitals. In our case, you do have to remember different codes. And a little life hack: uh, some nurses maybe like to use their little journal or whatever notepad they use or report sheet or wherever they store that information. I personally like using Apple Notes. I have an Apple Notes section for nursing. Uh, depends on what contract it is. You could write down all the important key factors that you need as far as What's the RT number? Maybe what's blood's number? Because it gets really annoying to looking for phone numbers. Mm -hmm. So if you create like a little list for uh, list for yourself, I personally uh, made a list and I taped it on the back of my ba mm. uh, badge. It's more something I did. So you know where everything is. You don't got to find out what the number of the pharmacy is. You're just dialing it up. Um, but this Apple Notes, it serves more as a purpose as rem remembering maybe your login access. Uh, uh, access to mainframe. In this case, in our hospital, uh, the charge doesn't do acuity. You have to log in by like 2 a.m. and do your own acuities so they know how to like staff the uh, the hospital. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, a great little resource to write things down. Or maybe you are uh, confused in this hospital that lactics are gray or ammonia has to be on ice. Maybe you forget those little things. Take advantage of the, uh, the notebook or Apple Note and write all these little key factors in so you don't forget the miscellaneous mm -hmm. things. Yeah, when you brought up the phone number portion... I just remember that being like being a travel nurse, you rarely answer the phone, especially when you first start. Not my job. Because it's so funny because when you first start off, like the first, I want to say four weeks, 
to a little bit over over a month. You're never answering a phone because like you don't know where, what the question is going to be. You're not going to know how to answer it. Yeah, just look confused. Like you already have so much going on on your play. The last thing you want to yeah. do is answer the phone. Yeah, it's so funny because every travel nurse is the, the same way because it's not like we don't want to answer the phone. It's just like if we answer the phone, we know what's going to happen. We're going to say, hold on. Let me ask someone and you guys look for somebody to ask. Especially when you have to transfer another patient to a room mm -hmm. or they ask you for the phone number to the unit. Like, yeah. uh, I don't know. Yeah, so it's so funny about phone rings. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of it for sure. I just recently started answering phones because now I know how to transfer stuff and put people on hold and do all that stuff because you would think they would make like, it would be a universal phone by now, but every hospital, it's like a charting system. You, th you would think that there's a universal, universal charting system, but there isn't. So you would think there's like a universal phone just to make things simple. Mm-hmm. I just thought about a point because you just said that mm -hmm. about universe, universal things. So a lot of times it could get really stressful about knowing what unit you're floating to and what has to be done at what time. So like back in the day, and this is when I was using Cerner or other charting systems, even like Meditech in Austin, Texas, you always wrote down the things you have to do in your 12 hour shift and all that. Mm -hmm. What I really like about Epic is you have this brain feature. So if you have three or four patients, it doesn't matter the brain uh, how do I, how would I, how would you describe the brain? The brain is basically a giant timeline of your 12 hour shift. You see all your patients there and you see all the important tasks that you have to do. Mm -hmm. And you could also set reminders for yourself. I don't know if you know that, or you can make notes on Epic so you can set things. For example, if you want to do a 5 AM uh, daily wait, mm -hmm. you could just put it into the brain and let it hang there. And it's mm -hmm. going to be like a note for you to check off like a to-do list. Oh, yeah, so cool. that creates, yeah, that creates a lot of like functionality which makes it easier for your floating because then you could keep track of everything on this brain you should do an epic course because i know why you could do that yeah someone taught me and i'm like yeah. life hack that's yeah, interesting yeah because not everybody has daily weights here you right and even in icu it has like that notification for the patients that require require it right yeah but does that is that has to be an order that's set for that to pop up because i, I know the meds pop up but the only reason they pop up because of the uh, <clears throat> the orders okay so here's the truth man um, <laughs> sometimes you have a chf or like some, some there's some some patients you know you need a daily weight mm -hmm. like dialysis or something and sometimes if there's no managed order daily weight in there i'm not gonna do it sometimes i want to be a hero and do the daily weight it just depends on like what's going on the time especially go to a telly floor they preferably preferably want the patient standing up on a bed scale I got three Purex to check up on. I might be changing all three of those patients. That fourth patient, the daily weight, is just going to have to mm -hmm. hold off for days, man. Yeah. So, yeah, if it doesn't, if it's not in the managed orders, but I know that it has to be done, sometimes I'll push it off mm -hmm. because there's just more important tasks to get done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another big point is to speak up. If you need help, let them know you need help. Don't, don't, uh, don't struggle because everyone knows you're, on a different unit. Everyone knows you're not as home units, so you're going to have questions. You're gonna have have times where you're gonna need somebody else to help you. So don't try to don't make yourself drown for no reason. So just make you're making it known. I mean, it's it's kind of easier said than done, you could say, because everybody, especially coming from the ICU, you wanna do everything for your patient and you wanna be the one doing it to make sure it gets done. And when you get floated, you can't do everything for your patient. Yeah. And if you try to do everything, it becomes an issue. And I've noticed like if for me I'm not sure how you felt about that. Like, do you, do you feel like you try to do everything for your patient even when you're floating somewhere else? Uh, def definitely mm -hmm. there's times like that. And that's like the next point that we're going to talk about is the ICU thing. Um, but kind of like circling back to like the speak up thing that you mentioned mm -hmm. is, yes, it's vital to do that. And a lot of times a nurse is not telepathic or a charge nurse is not telepathic. She doesn't know what's going on in your brain. You know, like that meme where the house is burning mm -hmm. and the dog is like saying, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I'm thinking about. Like you might be swapped, stressed out, but you got this amazing poker face and no one is going to help you out if you don't speak up and say something yeah. so if they're not gonna know right they're not gonna know no one can read your mind they're not gonna know that you need help yeah so if you're under pressure just say something and most of the time i feel like it's also like this trauma thing that maybe i don't know if nursing is all entitled about entitled about it but sometimes i struggle with that where it's like you have to make your needs known mm -hmm. and if you don't make your needs known like outside of work it might affect you in the workplace where you're you're trying to be this super nurse and you feel ashamed if you don't you can't get it done so you kind of try to get it out you don't make your needs known and then you're swamped and you're mm -hmm. draining and you're stressed out you might want to come home and smash a bottle of wine <laughs> yeah and some is so simple like like 
You can ask for help one time and I could improve your shift drastically. Just that one task, just because it might save you half an hour and half an hour is so much time. Yes. And then going back to what you mentioned is we have this ICU dilemma when we're floating to different units where, yes, like you want to do everything for your patient. And sometimes I catch myself where I'm in a chart and I'm just looking at like um, I'm looking at lab values or how can we improve this patient better? What should be done? And then you just get kind of lost in things because ultimately like you have four or five patients or three in PCC, whatever, you can't do everything. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just have to leave the doctoring and nursing that you want to do so much and just leave it up to the to the doctor to take care of it. Um, but you could definitely make a recommendation. And um, and we're speaking from night shift. So mm -hmm. day shift, I feel like it's a little bit easier. Like, hey, you want you want something done? The doctor's already kind of there. You could just speak up mm, right. versus in our case as night nurses, we can't be heroes and do things and call a doctor at 4 a.m. for mm -hmm. this recommendation. It's more of like passing it on to the, to the day shift and hoping that they get things done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see it like we see it. I feel like in a good way, we see it more as an experience of floating. It's not it's not bad. It's just something that, that you go through and you just try to learn as much as you can. Because what I noticed when I was when I got flowed to oncology, uh, my last shift, is I was looking at, first of all, I don't want to be in oncology. I'm like, because I never liked to do oncology in the first place. So I was like, oh man, I got to do oncology, like something that I, that I know I don't like. So first I thought I was going to be a drag. I wasn't going to like it too much. And then I came in, I was a break nurse, which was cool. So I could like kind of lay low and just break people. But then when I got patients, I was like, right, let's try to make the best of this because I couldn't um, you know, put my AirPods in because the manager was there and stuff like that. So you couldn't put the AirPods in and stuff like that. So um, <clears throat> what I decided to do was to look up chemo meds because I never looked up chemo meds. And I was just like learning about different chemotherapies, uh, why certain chemotherapies you, have, you need to premedicate, why certain chemotherapies you need to give platelets and all these interesting things. And I was like, wow, like this is like, this is like almost, <clears throat> so like the CNAs, how they view their medications like a chemist almost given propofol or uh, vex or whatever they got to they got to give to sedate and paralyze that patient. The chemo doctors or oncologists they're doing the same thing both chemo drugs. They're trying to figure out the best way to approach this cancer and what chemo they think is, is going to to work best. And it's especially, especially interesting when they don't know where this cancer actually came from, so they try to figure it out. So they start talking about like different markers like this has this marker so suspicious of breast cancer so we're going to treat it as a, as it started in breast cancer and i was like oh shit like a lot of actual thought and a lot of things actually go into this now. and i got kind of mind blown by how this chemo works yeah and this is and what you just said your story is just a perfect example of the outlook that you should have in experiencing floating but just in general in in life uh let this your situation is not working out you have to float somewhere so instead of like being a Debbie Downer about it, and we before the show we talked about a Debbie Downer, right? That if you that you floated in the sense, you have this positive outlook where no matter where you are, you're making the best of the situation, and you're looking things up, and you're learning about it, and you're having a positive experience, and that's ultimately what it comes down to, and what comes down to life is you're so comfortable. And back in the day, maybe we used to like. Like we used to pray we don't get to flow. Like we were just getting anxious about it. We hated it. But now it's more of like, okay, I'm floating. What am I going to learn today? Mm -hmm. It's like this positive experience where growth is happening. And, and that's, what it, that's what it is. If you are a nurse, you are just in your unit. It gets very repetitive. You learn the same stuff. And you might not want to float because you're not leaning into the growth. You're leaning into the comfort. Mm -hmm. You don't want to try something new and experience that and that's ultimately where growth happens that's what life is about you don't stagnate you keep on growing and evolving so just apply that that paradigm shift into floating next time and mm -hmm. it's going to be such a better experience yeah i'm kind of curious because i feel like i ask a lot of nurses if how long they want to be a bedside nurse for and a lot of them say that they want to go do something else so i'm curious out of those nurses nurses that want to do something else have they floated to different units so they experience different Have, forms of bedside. Right, yeah. So maybe even though they might not necessarily want to do bedside, but for example, if an ICU nurse flows, flows to med on days, she gets a feel for how management works. And maybe she might like how management flows in med surge and she might devote her time to become a uh, manager like in the future. Maybe they want to go back to school. 
or for example, you might go to oncology and the NPs are running an oncology. It might like the way they interact with the patient stuff, and it might help you decide, hey, maybe I want to be a nurse practitioner in oncology. Yeah, I feel like nurses, if nurses, because I feel like you have to get the same answers that when you ask people how long you want to bedside for. Usually they say, I'm not sure I want to do something else, but they're not sure what they want to do, and yet they haven't ventured out of the ICU. What a cool idea that would be for hospitals to initiate something like mm-hmm. that, where you're getting kind of burnt out of your current position and you have the ability to shadow in a way another nurse or work this other unit and see how this experience is for you. So I asked my last staffing job if I could do that, if I could have a day where I could shadow in the trauma I used to back at <clears throat> back in Illinois. And they said, yeah, but you have to do come on your own time and you wouldn't be paid for it. So it's like a financial thing. They don't want to have to pay you the 12 hours of your hourly rate just to shadow a nurse when they could use you as a nurse on the floor. Yeah, it'd be more of a dope yeah. benefit or incentive of a hospital, but they are for profit. That'd be really cool incentive. And they doing that. Yeah, now you could push for that because how cool would that be? I probably would, would take it sometimes if you could if they offer you maybe, hey, you could take six days in the year that you could float to a different unit if you're feeling burnt out or, or if you want to just try it out. Yeah, that'd be cool. You, you shadow, and ultimately has to go, come down to that nurse as well, and to see if they want to do an experience like that and mm-hmm. not get paid for it. And uh, I just thought about that. I did the same thing when I was thinking about going into CRNA school. I mm-hmm. talked to my manager, and I had the ability to shadow a CRNA in Lagrange for a day, and just kind of talk to our shift. When it was unpaid, mm-hmm. but it kind of made me really like the position. But things change in life, and uh, it's not a career that i want to pursue anymore yeah 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 i feel you maybe they could do like pay you half your pay because that'd be still cool that way you you have some kind of incentive to just come in on your off day that'd, yeah. that'd be interesting um because how cool would it be for example if like uh, you wanted to do do peds but you're not sure that you want to do peds but you've been a nurse for four years in let's just say uh med surge. and how cool would it be just to have like a shadow day to peds yeah, and thinking a little bit uh, into that project, not all hospitals have PED units. So then these hospitals would maybe have to make contracts among themselves where, mm-hmm. hey, this is a medical professional. They don't feel this unit. And it's like a program amongst these hospitals where you could float and experience not only different parts of bedside, but a drastic transition like ER to uh, the pediatrics unit. Yeah, But sometimes low-key floating sucks. There's been a, a one shift that I had where I got floated to unit, I had four patients, and I got floated at 11, and I had five patients. So for the whole night, I had nine patients, and that, and that sucks, and that sucks. So it's, you know, it's not always, uh, it's not always going to be like a good time, you could say, but each experience is, is good in its own way. For example, when I had the nine patients in that one shift, that was very humbling. It made me realize how important... It is to have appropriate appropriate staffing, how important it is to have good teamwork on the unit because at that point, if we're doing state ratios, everyone's overloaded. Yeah. And so it's cool to see that. And the reason why we're having such high patient load for those that are listening and their eyes opened up, it's because the way this hospital functions is they still have eight-hour shifts grandfathered in. So there's nurses that are working eights and twelves. So there's a shift that comes on from 7P to 7A but there's also a shift that comes on from 11P to 7A. Mm-hmm. So now they're balancing staffing. Maybe some nurses are staying over the extra four, um, but in this case, the travel nurses are the pawns that they're kind of filling the gaps in for scheduling. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to also think about how day shift was for us in Pasadena and to give any uh, real tips because we did float a few times and that's very overwhelming going into like a step down unit in the in, uh, on day shift not knowing anything uh, but the same thing just introduce yourself uh, usually the the unit clerks that work on every single hospital they're f- fairly good at mm-hmm. getting you the vocera and mm-hmm. the phone and the login so you at least have that part of the job so you could communicate with the unit and the doctors um and as far same thing, just say hello, be positive, and ask those basic questions as far as where your supplies are and things to do your job, Pixis access, and uh, you're ready to rock. Mm-hmm. And the only difference that I'm thinking about is just kind of finding out 
how th- doctors are rounding or if there's any th- something specific because like in the ICU you have designated times like at 9 a.m or whatever when there's doctors are rounding with everybody in the unit and you have to communicate with them and maybe the unit that you're working on could be something similar or residents are doing it mm-hmm. so a day shift comes with a little bit more of a um i would say um day shift comes with a little bit more of like struggles added on yeah. or more tasks or 100 i'm kind of looking at the word that i want to say but uh a little bit yeah you have to familiarize yourself with the unit a lot quicker mm-hmm. and just kind of guns loaded ready to go yeah normally on days it's busier it's it's, it's busier that's why a lot of people prefer nights because it's a little less chaotic there's not as much stuff going on as much people people coming in and out of the rooms it's a, just a lot but i think the the biggest takeaway, if you're going to to float, I think like you mentioned, Matt, is just treat it like an experience. Uh, just take it in, take it for what it is, try to make the best of it, just like you should do with any, anything else. Even though you're not in the best situation, there's always some positive. There's always a bright light at the end of that tunnel. Just take it take it in and just go through the motion, do what you have to do, and just fulfill your role, but also make sure that you feel good about what you did at the end of the day. Don't leave work regretting something that you like didn't do or you wish you should have said that or wish you would have done that make sure you try to get it on shift because i feel like sometimes maybe uh, we do that as nurses where we don't always go the extra mile and i feel like going extra mile is always always helpful just just to help you mentally show you that you can do these things uh, that you kind of put your mind to so just yeah just treat an experience and just get the best out of it and embrace the suck Mm -hmm. all right ladies and gents if you found a value in this episode about floating and maybe you couldn't another nurse could use this content go ahead and share it subscribe like comment we do appreciate it thank you for your time and see you on the next one peace out